So the clinical phenotypes, you can think of them also as stemming from what you see on a histopathology perspective. There is hypertrophy. The hypertrophy here is unaccounted for, and clinically that can be a challenge in older individuals where you can have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy coexisting, say, with hypertension. The presence of uh, disarray has been recognized long time ago and has been used as a gold standard on histopathology tissue. The disarray is present at the level of the fibers and the myofibrils as well. And then there is advanced fibrosis. The fibrosis that is present in HCM is both replacement fibrosis as well as interstitial fibrosis. The replacement fibrosis is irreversible, but the interstitial fibrosis may be reversible. Uh, many mutations have been described in more than 11 genes. I just highlight some of here. The most common ones that we see are the beta myosin heavy chain mutations and the myosin binding protein C mutations. We'll not dwell a lot on these uh, mutations, but perhaps you will see some insights into why they may be significant later on in the presentation. The natural history in the vast majority of patients is a stable benign course really, and that's what you typically see if you have a practice that catches a wide variety of patients. In tertiary centers, we tend to see more of the problematic cases. So issues of sudden death, atrial fibrillation, people presenting with symptoms of shortness of breath, and both heart failure with a normal ejection fraction and the end stage with a depressed ejection fraction. Over the years, we've had few patients that have undergone cardiac transplantation in this institution because of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that ended up in this end stage. I'll say probably five to 10% of patients may end up in this situation and some predictors could be gradually enlarging diameters and thinner walls. We're not talking major thinning over the period of time, but you're looking at one to two millimeter changes over three to five year periods. So subtle changes can foretell, so to speak, what may happen down the line. Hence the importance of regular evaluation, even if someone's symptoms appear to be stable. I'll cover morphology because that's one of the most fascinating features for many. Cardiac function, which is key when we talk about how we treat them, the presence of dynamic obstruction, mitral valve disease, these are intertwined. Differential diagnosis, treatment of dynamic obstruction, uh, sudden cardiac death, early phenotypic abnormalities, promising novel treatments and centers of excellence. So the morphology. So the classic morphology is asymmetric hypertrophy. You can see patients with apical hypertrophy and also concentric hypertrophy. Concentric hypertrophy can be challenging to sort of pinpoint to HCM if coexisting diseases are present. And one has to do a diligent search to make sure there is nothing else happening on board. How frequent do these occur? The vast majority of cases that are seen are asymmetric hypertrophy. 90% really involve the septum, about 1% midventricular hypertrophy. And these patients can have a mid cavity that is very small in dimension and also dynamic obstruction happening in it leading to an apex that balloons with time and forming an apical aneurysm later on. Then there is apical hypertrophy, initially increased wall thickness in the apical segments, followed by thinning and aneurysm formation. There are some studies earlier on, not necessarily more recent ones, that have reported isolated hypertrophy in the infralateral or posterior wall or the lateral wall. These tend to be more challenging to diagnose reliably by echo, and we'll get into that. Concentric hypertrophy, about 5%. So there is the classic asymmetric hypertrophy, and if you see this, there is really no challenge. I, uh, odds are very high that this is the diagnosis, HCM. You can also uh, appreciate the presence of asymmetric hypertrophy on CMR. Short axis slices, be it echo or CMR, are very valuable because they will show you a cross section across all segments and now you can compare them to one another. So the septum is quite thick here. 
both anterior and inferior septum, the anterior wall as well, the lateral wall, the inferior lateral wall is the least thick. Uh, can be normal thickness, can be increased thickness as well in some cases. Uh, in individuals who do not have good windows by echocardiography and who are not candidates for CMR for one reason or another, uh, you can do cardiac CT, and we've had some patients who were evaluated by cardiac CT. That's an example of asymmetric hypertrophy by cardiac CT. Again, you can do long axis cuts and short axis cuts. There have been really no head to head comparison in terms of CT, CMR, how they compare. As you can imagine, nobody is thrilled to subject the patient to contrast agents twice and with their younger age group to let them get CT just for the purpose of research. There is a concentric hypertrophy pattern on echocardiography from an HCM patient. The tricky part here is you want to get good orientation and good perpendicular short axis cuts. Otherwise, off axis views can be very deceiving. Uh, epical hypertrophy is shown here, and here we've used a high frequency transducer. So that transducer gives you a lot of details of the myocardium close to the, to the transducer location here, and you can appreciate the presence of hypertrophy, but with higher frequencies, we do not see that well the far field, which is okay for the objective of this case. Uh, also, intravenous contrast agents, we refer to them now as ultrasound contrast in uh, enhancing agents or endocardial border enhancing agents will show you the endocardium and you can see here with these asterisks the apical hypertrophy and the narrower apical cavity compared to the rest of the heart. Sometimes these would be thinner and sometimes you would see clots. The presence of an apical aneurysm is a very important finding be it by echo or CMR it identifies someone at a high risk of sudden cardiac death. Epical uh, hypertrophy by CMR shown here, and by cardiac CT as well shown here. So you get very comparable images. Another finding that was fascinating for a period of time is the presence of crypts, uh, shown here by these white arrows, mostly in the inferior lateral wall and inferior septum. An early publication from this group, German Zetel, referred to the presence of, of crypts as only in visualized in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. There are other reports that have been published since then that showed crypts in normal individuals. Having said that, the, when an exam is performed, a CMR exam is performed, Ideally, these should be looked for and if present reported. There are no data as of now to show that these individuals uh, have a different outcome, so to speak, than those without crypts. There are data that these crypts may be present in patients who are carrying of pathogenic genes, but there are no data to show that they develop later on the full-blown HCM phenotype. So enough of morphology, let's talk about systolic function. Of course, we characterize morphology by commence and dimensions and ideally volumes uh, and diastolic and systolic volumes uh, indices for a body surface area, mass, mass index, and the patterns of hypertrophy are qualitative. When we talk about systolic function, many indices can be used to describe systolic function from simple to more or to less simple. Fractional shortening, ejection fraction, and systolic pressure and systolic volume relations, stroke work, how fast the velocity accelerates in the ventricle proximal to the site of obstruction, and if there is no obstruction in the left ventricular outflow tract. Myocardial velocities, this could be segmental or at the level of the mitral annulus, and strain and strain rate signals, also segmental and global, as well as torsion. We'll touch quickly about these. Uh, so why is it important to know EF? EF is a marker of survival in HCM, and this is the dilated hypokinetic phenotype with much worse outcome. And it marks a disease that gets treated very differently the way you would treat patients with HFREF, so to speak. Whereas on the other hand, digoxin would not be a good option for someone with classic HCM. 
Uh, myocardial velocities can be done by color-coded tissue Doppler and by pulse tissue Doppler. We'll see examples of these and many of you are familiar. Let me spend some time on strain. Uh, so strain is a marker of systolic performance, basically how a segment behaves during systole. It gets compressed and the convention is that compression is shown as a displacement below the baseline. Uh, and you see here a normal individual and a patient with HCM. This is longitudinal strain in the apical four chamber view. The more negative the value, the better the performance. Uh, a higher value, less negative value is not good. If you want to remove the negative and think about it, just look at absolute numbers. Higher numbers, good. Lower numbers, not good. And this HCM patient has a markedly reduced value of about 7%. I would say it is much more consistent to see reduced global longitudinal strain in HCM than other types of strain. This is a case showing circumferential strain. Uh, and again, a normal subject, an HCM subject. The example I chose is showing you a better performance for the normal compared to the HCM. Having said that, there are many individuals that have normal circumferential strain and you are only able to uncover abnormal systolic performance during exercise where you see a good increment in the normal subject, but not in the patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to the extent that these measurements can determine exercise performance. We can also do radial strain. Radial strain can be thought of simply as thickening, how much a segment gets thicker from end diastole to end systole. And that's a normal patient. This is a patient with HCM. It can be deceiving when you see a small cavity to judge systolic properties and looking at strain can give you an edge over ejection fraction. The geometry of the ventricle, uh, the presence of preserved circumferential strain, the presence of a preserved torsion, as we will speak later on, can make the ejection fraction look normal when the systolic function is not normal. Um, so twist describes a rotation that happens in the heart where the base rotates in one direction and the apex rotates in an opposite direction. And the difference between the apical and basal rotation is uh, what constitutes the twist. So the apex rotates in a normal individual in a counterclockwise direction. We are looking at through the diaphragm and someone who's on a bed before us. And this is how we are describing counter and uh, clockwise rotation. So the apex in that sense is moving counterclockwise, the base clockwise. Long story short, abnormalities have been described, but not really in the absolute twist. As you see here, it looks very similar between normal individuals, hypertrophic, non-obstructive, and obstructive cardiomyopathy. The differences are more pronounced in the presence of exercise. You see augmentation in the normal but less so in the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients. This is an analysis that takes place offline. It takes long time, doesn't add much, so really research purposes. Not recommended. The simple recommendation for systolic function still is ejection fraction and now global longitudinal strain. This is the earliest study that looked at relation of strain to outcomes in HCM. Since then, there have been many. It included 93 patients, the usual younger age group, 36 years of age, maximum wall thickness of 20, good ejection fraction, about a fifth had dynamic obstruction with some risk uh, factors for sudden cardiac death. The majority uh, had only 30%, had only one risk factor. Very few had three or more risk factors. Uh, as you would expect, in the absence of clinical events, you go for some surrogates of outcome. Not that non-sustained VTEC is a great surrogate, but that was the parameter chosen in this study, and it occurred in 24 patients. In comparison to uh, other parameters like maximum wound thickness, NT pro BMP, the number of segments with impaired longitudinal strain was associated 
with much better with the non-sustained ventricular tachycardia episodes. We can talk more about strain if there is time. Later on, we routinely report it in this lab. Diastolic function. So it's one of the abnormalities that have been recognized for decades in HCM. It can account for symptoms even in the absence of obstruction. If you say, why do patients with HCM have diastolic dysfunction? It's an abnormal structure related to the presence of fibrosis that you saw, the hypertrophy and the disarray. Easy to say that fibrosis and hypertrophy are associated with increased chamber stiffness. And then if you look at the myocytes themselves, they have intrinsic problems with relaxation and abnormal calcium handling shown in some studies. The contribution of ischemia, even in the absence of epicardial coronary disease, and also non-uniform <clears throat> relaxation and filling. Ideally, different segments should relax at the same time that keeps the ventricular pressure low and allows for rapid LV filling. If you have this heterogeneity, the pressure in the ventricle does not decline fast and the rates of filling drop. We use tools by echocardiography of mitral inflow. We look at pulmonary vein flow that looks at left atrial filling, annular velocities, as well as pulmonary artery pressures as surrogates of left atrial pressure. Someone who doesn't have pulmonary disease, the main reason they would have an increase in their pulmonary artery pressures is a high left atrial pressure. And all these signals are recommended for routine acquisition and make use of when drawing inferences about diastolic function in HCM. It's an LV pressure reporting from a very symptomatic patient and you can appreciate that their minimum pressure is quite high. This is about 17 millimeters mercury. Normally the minimum pressure is zero to two at most and there are studies where with high fidelity catheters where patients received positive lusotropic agents like isoprenaline and that resulted in even subatmospheric minimum pressure. So this individual has a lot of problems uh, in terms of his pressures. The pre-A pressure is up at 24. That's the pressure that is very similar to left atrial pressure and the EDP is also way up more than 30s. You can see a steep rise in diastolic pressure in the ventricle with the atrial contraction, there is the P wave, there is the AY rise in the LV diastolic pressure signifying that the stiffness or to be more precise, late diastolic stiffness of the ventricle is increased. We look at mitral inflow velocities and we look at annular velocities and we can combine them to get surrogates of mean left atrial pressure. The peak E goes up as the left atrial pressure goes up and so just looking at the relaxation pattern can be deceiving, as in this case, where the atrium is contracting forcefully, as you saw, in the ventricular pressure, as well as the Doppler signal of mitral inflow. But the peak E by itself, it's almost 100 centimeters per second. That's an indicator that the transmitral pressure gradient early on is increased. The annular velocity is reduced reflecting the impairment in LV relaxation properties. When patients develop diastolic dysfunction, they go through phases. So early on, the pressure that goes up the first and is the highest is the end diastolic pressure. And that can be recognized by late diastolic events. So the pulmonary vein atrial reversal velocity here is prolonged and prominent, about 40 centimeters per second particularly when you compare it to the mitral inflow. When the atrium contracts, it's easier to send blood into the lower pressure pulmonary vein than into the higher pressure left ventricle in late diastole. As the disease advances, you can get a restrictive filling pattern. The arrow points here to mid-diastolic flow or an L wave, and it is present because LA pressure is up, LV relaxation is incomplete and is still taking place in mid-diastole when normally it should be over in early diastole. And notice how small these annular velocities. Take a look at the scale, it's two and four centimeters per second. Why the scale broke down so low? Because these velocities are so minute. Restrictive filling is associated with worse outcomes in HCM and there are several observational studies both from Europe and from the United States showing restrictive filling associated with higher likelihood of hospitalizations for heart failure. 
in the presence of a normal ejection fraction. A surrogate of diastolic function is the left atrial diameter. You can say, however, that the LA size is not just an indicator of diastolic function, but also other abnormalities as mitral regurge, for example. It's a study from the Toronto group where they looked at the left atrium anteroposterior diameter, so a very crude measure even of LA size. And you can see here that the overall survival is much worse when the left atrium remains dilated to this level, 46 millimeters after myectomy. These were patients that were left with excellent myectomy results with no significant dynamic obstruction. Highlighting the importance of the persistent diastolic dysfunction and its contribution to symptoms and worse survival. Another indicator of diastolic function here is the E to E prime ratio, and it is associated with peak oxygen consumption. This is work done with Texas children. So this is work done in children. Um, and we show here that as the E to E prime ratio goes up, so the left atrial pressure goes up, peak O2 consumption goes down. There are also similar data in adults that has been published. Importantly, if you look at predictors of death, cardiac arrest, ventricular tachycardia in these children with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the E to E prime ratio was an important predictor as was peak oxygen consumption, but not maximum uh, septal thickness or E prime velocity was barely significant. So these indices should be looked at and considered because they can help risk stratify. The issue of disarray and its contribution to diastolic dysfunction was not thoroughly tackled except for one study. This is a small study with a group of patients who had uh, biopsy samples and at the same time rating of diastolic dysfunction by echocardiography. And you can see as the level of disarray goes up, so does the diastolic dysfunction that is present. Uh, we talked about fibrosis and we said fibrosis contributes to increased interstitial, uh, contributes to increased chamber stiffness. That's an example from a patient with uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and late gadolinium hyperenhancement. You see the arrows in the short axis, two short axis views, as well as an apical four chamber view. And you see the corresponding mitral inflow pattern. That's a pseudo normal pattern, so to speak, high left atrial pressure and very small annular velocities. Importantly, the more the scar burden and the, the more the number of segments with delayed hyper enhancement, the worse the indices of compliance or the higher the indices of chamber stiffness as the ratio of E to E prime ratio to end diastolic volume. So E to E prime is a surrogate of pressure. The end diastolic volume is volume, obviously. So uh, there is that. Granted, it's a widespread. It's not a tight relation, as you can expect. Other variables contribute to stiffness, and these are not perfect parameters that go one for one for what chamber stiffness is. Another indicator of uh, fibrosis can be recognized by CMR with uh, T1 mapping and looking at extracellular volume from two individuals, one with an ECD of 22% and another one with almost 32%. When you look at what that translates to, uh, patients with a prolonged T1 relaxation time, and T1 relaxation time is an indicator of the myocardium in general, be it myocytes, fibrous tissue, or both. And you can do it without giving gadolinium. You can see here as the LV mass goes up, the T1 relaxation time gets longer. Uh, it signifies probably more of a advanced disease or more pathology, what the pathology precisely is difficult to put a handle on just by that measurement. You can look at T1 relaxation time and average E to E prime ratio. Again, the longer that time interval, the higher the LA pressure. Probably not a surprising finding. You already show it is so that it is related to LV mass. The more the mass, the sicker the ventricle, the higher the LA pressure usually. Uh, this one is probably more interesting than the previous two slides because it's relating the extracellular volume fraction 
So the extracellular volume increased for whatever reason. We are assuming it's interstitial fibrosis. This is determined by CMR and its relation to peak oxygen consumption. The relation is not linear, but is a significant inverse relation. The higher the extracellular volume fraction, the worse the uh, peak oxygen consumption. So we've covered function, systolic, diastolic. Let's talk about dynamic obstruction. The whole mark of that in the cath lab with LV aorta pressure gradients. Uh, they could be present at rest, but they can also be provoked. Most physiologic with exercise, amyl nitrite, we do not use it in this lab. I believe most labs in the United States do not use it. Perhaps the Mayo Clinic still use it. Valzelva maneuver, this should be performed routinely by the sonographer. You do not need to request it. And then isoproternol has been used in the cath lab much less frequently nowadays, dobutamine in the echo lab, and then post-PVC. Granted, you can see obstruction provoked as well in the setting of hyperdynamic ventricles with anemia, decreased intravascular volume with hypovolemia, as well as geometric changes after mitral valve repair. Example of a post-PVC increased gradient shown here, Brock and Brock effect, reduced pulse pressure. The increased myocardial contractility leads to this very high LV pressure and severe obstruction. By echocardiography, you can see it nicely by 2D, shown in the right side of the screen here, where the leaflet touches the septum, and by color, you see the acceleration. It's like an inverted Y and the MR jet directed posterolaterally. The M mode, with its great temporal resolution, allows you not to just recognize that SAM is present, but to say how long SAM is taking place. You see the white arrows in the M mode reporting to the left pointing to the contact between the septum and the anterior mitral leaflet. The longer this contact, the more severe the obstruction. Obstruction can happen at other levels, not just at the LV outflow tract. The yellow arrow in the left side of the screen points to obstruction happening in the apex. And by continuous wave Doppler, we see it here. Notice that it is happening earlier than the obstruction that is happening more proximal in the ventricle. So patients frequently have multiple level of obstructions and also have mitral regurg that confounds the situation. We have tools whereby we identify where the obstruction is present reliably. One of these is mapping based on using pulse wave Doppler and sampling it through the LV outflow tract. And you see here that the velocity is not that high, but once the sample volume is placed in the outflow tract where the obstruction is present, there is aliasing indicating that there is a high pressure gradient and a high velocity at this level. Um, frequently, we are told is there dynamic obstruction and how do you differentiate it from mitral regurg? So this is someone with a peak velocity of six. We do the modified Bernoulli equation. We come up with 144. When you have very high gradients, it is good to have confidence that this is a correct value. So we tend to work things backwards. I'll show you what I mean. For the mitral peak velocity, this is a reflection of the difference between the left ventricular and the left atrial pressure. So if we do the 4V squared and we add to it the left atrial pressure, then we have the left ventricular pressure. And if we know someone's systolic blood pressure is 100 and we assume this is similar to the pressure in the root of the aorta, it's an, it's an approximation, then you would expect a gradient of at least 127. So this gradient is certainly compatible and makes sense with the data we have here. Why does dynamic obstruction develop? And what happens to mitral regurgitation in this disease? First, if you compare, this is a short axis of the ventricle. If you compare the location of the papillary muscles in a patient, in a normal subject, with a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and dynamic obstruction, the papillary muscles are displaced anteriorly, as these arrows show. Another thing that is happening is their leaflets, the mitral valve anterior leaflet, is elongated relative to the LV size. And being elongated, 
along with the reduced mobility of the posterior leaflet, you end up with a segment of the anterior leaflet that is not covered by the posterior leaflet, so to speak. This gets subjected to drag forces that push it towards the septum and close the alveolar flow tract. Certainly the situation is helped by the curvature of the septum that brings it closer to the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, as well as by a forceful contraction. So given the so many variables that lead to dynamic obstruction, the degree of systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve does not always relate to the extent of hypertrophy. And that's important to recognize when you think of treatment because septal reduction therapy in these patients when the septum is not that thick, not only can be associated with problems and complications, but may also leave the patient with a significant degree of obstruction. In these situations, it is best to tackle the mitral valve. Sometimes this is done surgically by plication and more recently with the mitral clip procedure. Differential diagnosis. So when we think of HCM, we can think along two lines for the differential, LVH. And here there is a host of conditions that can lead to obstruction. The importance of a thorough history, physical exam, paying attention to specific findings can help you dissect these possibilities. Uh, that's an example of a patient with HCM and aortic stenosis, and we can assess aortic stenosis in someone with dynamic obstruction by transesophageal echo, CMR, and certainly cardiac CT. This is a patient with a subvalvular membrane and a fixed obstruction that was referred to get alcohol septal ablation, and you see the membrane nicely here by the arrow in the left panel, and if you take a look, the signal is a signal of earlier rather than late peaking. It's more of a fixed, not a dynamic obstruction. There is also some degree of aortic regurgitation I just pointed to. This is not uncommon. It can happen in up to 30% of these cases with subaortic membranes, but it's very uncommon in patients with HCM who have not had any procedures done for them. Example of Fabry disease that improved with recombinant alpha-galactosidase A treatment is shown here. Septal thickness is less by echo and also less by CMR. Actually, old thickness around the ventricle looks much better after treatment, as well as the mitral inflow pattern. The other differential is the dynamic obstruction, and you can see this in elderly women with a sigmoid septum. It's an entity by itself that was described by Dr. Topol many years ago. These, are pa these patients do not have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but can have SAM and dynamic obstruction. It was reported after mitral valve repair, and you still see it. Pa massive posterior mitral annular calcification that pushes the whole mitral valve apparatus towards the septum can lead to dynamic obstruction. Acute myocardial infarction and stress-induced cardiomyopathy with epical dysfunction and a hyperdynamic base. I'll show you cases of anomalous insertion of papillary muscle. These should be recognized because they had a specific treatment by surgery. And after aortic valve replacement, when the ventricle is still thick and hyperdynamic and can have dynamic obstruction, as time goes by and LVH regresses, the severity of obstruction goes down and may be relieved. Uh, the direction of the MR jet is a clue to the presence of obstruction and can also be a clue to something other than obstruction. This is a patient with a flail segment in the posterior leaflet of the mitral valve and a lot of mitral regurg directed medially. This patient again was thought to have dynamic obstruction because of the jet directed anteriorly they underwent transesophageal echo and uncovered this diagnosis and they were referred for mitral valve repair. There is a anomalous insertion of the papillary muscle. The muscle inserts directly into the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, almost no cordy. To visualize these of axis views are often needed. This was a patient referred to us with a diagnosis of HCM 
As a child, she underwent myectomy, and you can see where the mouse is, some thinning of the septum, but she was still left with obstruction because of that anomalous insertion that wasn't recognized and tackled. You can also use CMR, and CMR has excellent resolution that shows you a lot of details about the pep muscle. The treatment of dynamic obstruction is with medications, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, uh, verapamil deltaism, diazoparamide because of its uh, negative inotropic properties, sotalol and amiodarone for arrhythmias. Uh, very little work with them in terms of observational studies and in particular nowadays fell out of favor, I would say. Sotalol has an edge over amiodarone because of its beta blocker properties. And then once the patient gets into the dilated phase, you will treat them the way you will treat the, uh, the dilated phase, the patients with HFREF. Example of the pressure recordings in the ventricle and the aorta at baseline in a patient with dynamic obstruction and a large gradient. Because of reduced contractility, LV systolic pressure drops, the dynamic obstruction drops, and the gradient is almost non-existent with disopyramide on board. If we use disopyramide, the guidelines advocate for using it in the hospital so you can monitor uh, their EKG and their uh, QRSQT durations. And also, uh, you want to be careful when you consider the drug in elderly individuals who may have narrow angle glaucoma and prostate obstruction. Um, prostate enlargement with urinary tract obstruction, so to speak. We've had few successes with disopyramide. The vast majority of patients, you do not see the dramatic improvement that you see on this slide. Dual chamber pacing was once thought of as a treatment for this disease, it was led by Dr. Lama Fanana Pazir from the NIH to the extent that they reported not just improvement in symptoms, improvement in gradients, but also reverse remodeling with the thicker ventricles becoming less thick. There were two randomized trials, one from the Mayo Clinic that I'm showing here and another trial led by Barry Marin called Empathy. Both had the same findings. There was also a European trial. Basically, what you see is the quality of life when the ventricular pacing is taking place is better than at baseline, but is not any better than when AI is taking place, pointing to a placebo effect. The exercise duration also better than at baseline. When you look at gradient, yes, it's significantly lower than when this is atrial pacing without ventricular pacing. But as you see from the histogram and the standard deviations, there was a lot of overlap between the two groups and the response was really small, at best 10 to 20 millimeters mercury subgroup analysis, albeit a small sample size pointed to the possibility that elderly subjects may be more likely to respond to pacing. Maximum VO2, however, nothing. Is not any better with V pacing compared to uh, atrial sensing, atrial tracking. Uh, or to baseline no pacing. That finished the pacemaker story and the interest in pacemakers. The main advantage I would say is if somebody has a pacemaker and you want to push beta blockers, you have room with the pacemaker on board. Septal reduction therapy is considered for patients who are on medications but are still symptomatic, be it with angina, with dyspnea or angina or syncope. The obstruction is due to systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, so we are talking basal obstruction and a gradient at rest of 30 or 60 with provocation. Uh, the first of these approaches for septal reduction is myectomy, has been performed many years ago. That's an example of the septal thickness before and after myectomy. You can appreciate now that this much uh, less thick or thinner septum is not able to contribute much to obstruction, and that's the whole idea of myectomy, and the effect is immediate. Though remodeling changes happen in the ventricle later on that lead to ventricular dilatation, and early on, there were reports of a significantly lower ejection fraction as ascertained by MAGA, not by echocardiography, even. Example of SAM uh, on M mode before myectomy and after myectomy, it is relieved. And you can also look at the short axis views 
panel C and panel G, you see the bite that took place. For myectomy results to be successful, the surgeon has to resect a good amount and not be timid. Uh, most surgeons and most cases where myectomy is needed is because either something was present that wasn't recognized, like an anomalous papillary muscle insertion, or too little resection took place. Uh, how does myectomy affect outcome? This is a study from the Mayo Clinic along with an Italian group, Jacopo, from um, some place in Italy blocking now on the look from Florence in Italy, showing that the outcome in patients who underwent myectomy is very similar to patients who had HCM and were non-obstructive and better than those who had obstruction but were left without surgery. One way of looking at this data is to say, yes, surgery improves survival. Another way of looking at the data is those who had a lot of obstruction but were denied surgery were denied surgery for a reason. So they were sicker to start with. That's the problem with observational studies that you always have to deal with. Nevertheless, it's a promising finding and it's a finding also that is well supported by many other observational studies with decent outcomes for patients who need myectomy and go through it. Alcohol septal ablation is based on the idea of inducing a localized infarction and you want to map the distribution of the septal perforator, what area of muscle it uses. In the older days, we used Albunex, Optisan. In Europe, they used Levovis. This is no longer available. Levovis, that is. And it is injected down the lumen of the inflated balloon that should be sitting very well in the septal perforator. Um, that's an example of contrast injected down the lumen of the balloon, and you can see the opacification of the septum. And you can see that the opacification is happening at the same site where the obstruction is taking place. Uh, we've done very few cases with transesophageal echo. Sometimes they may be needed. If someone doesn't have good windows, is very agitated during the study. In this case, we've done them with general anesthesia. The slide shows two nice examples. That's a case where the contrast is opacifying the muscle on the side of the left ventricle, which is involved with the SAM. On the other hand, if you look at this patient, the opacification is happening in the right ventricle side of the septum. So inducing infarction here will not necessarily help with the dynamic obstruction taking place in the L. That's the first publication from this institution by Dr. Lackis was the first author and Dr. Spencer looking at gradients pre and post ablation. You see this hump and the bifid pulse disappearing and, and ventricular pressures dropping with the relief of obstruction. We have to use the intracoronary injection of contrast agents and at times use of axis views to make sure the distribution of the septal perforator doesn't go to any place where you do not want to induce infarction. In this case, it was going to a papillary muscle and injection of contrast did not take place to avoid inducing papillary muscle infarction. The extent of opacification gives you a feel for how much necrosis you will end up with and how much muscle loss will take place, whether you relate that to peak CK or to spec perfusion defect. A smaller defect, a smaller infarction, as you, as you would expect, would be associated with lower likelihood of arrhythmias down the line. The arrhythmias down the line where ICD shocks, sudden death, and advanced heart block. Acutely, how does septal, uh, alcohol septal ablation works? The way it works is you produce, you cut the blood supply to the septum. The septum does not work. In this case, if you look at the strain, remember the normal performance of strain is to go below the baseline, and this is still happening for the lateral wall. But the septum is now dyskinetic, moving away from the lateral wall during systole and resulting in a drop in gradient. 
Patients are usually monitored in the ICU for one to two days. We use a daily bed. We encourage ambulation. The discharge is planned typically in three to five days in the absence of complications. We routinely track serial enzymes to get a feel for MI size. I will show you why. This is an independent predictor of outcome. We do not repeat echocardiography during the course of hospitalization unless there are concerns as, say, for example, pericardial effusion. Post-discharge, we see them at two weeks, three months, then once uh, every year if they are referred to us, or every four months if it's not a referral. We typically do, do uh, cardiopulmonary stress testing at baseline, three months, six months, yearly intervals, along with echo. And we always evaluate the risk factors for sudden cardiac death. This is a dynamic process. It is not fixed. Many complications have been reported, and obviously, if you do a lot of procedures, you will see them, but also if you do a lot of procedures, you will be less likely to encounter complications because you will recognize situations which you should not offer alcohol septal ablation or where a problem can happen during the procedure and you refrain from carrying further. So an example from an early experience, notice the LAD, and this is alcohol down the LAD. Uh, with the appearance of the vessel not so good. Uh, one of the dreaded complications is permanent pacemaker. This is again work from this institution when Dr. Cheng was then a fellow, showing that the predictors of a permanent pacemaker after alcohol septal ablation, one was the female gender, a bolus injection as opposed to a gradual injection. If you are doing things gradually and you see high grade AV block, you may decide to slow or stop. If you do not use contrast to guide you, we said that a large contrast area is associated with higher likelihood of block and ventricular arrhythmias. If you inject in more than one septal artery, again, you can look at no contrast and more than one septal artery as situations associated with larger infarction and left bundle branch block. The reason left bundle branch block is a predictor is 60 to 70 percent of patients develop right bundle branch block and so if they have a left bundle to start with and uh, they develop a right bundle branch block they go into complete AV block and patients are counseled in this situation of a very high likelihood of needing a permanent pacemaker. Uh, what are the predictors uh, of a hard uh, of outcome in a procedure as the alcohol septal ablation? This was a multi-center registry from many sites in the United States that looked at baseline variables, procedural variables, as well as three months variables. It was more than 800 patients. And basically a lower ejection fraction at baseline and more advanced NYHA class are not good things. A patient who leaves the cath lab with a large gradient on top of the other things is not a good thing. And a patient who is also left with a big gradient at three months is also not a good thing and is a predictor of worse outcome. Uh, the effective treatment of dynamic obstruction has amazing effects on LVH regression, improving diastolic function and heart failure symptoms. This looks at LV mass at one and two years, decreasing significantly. This is by echocardiography. This is also uh, was shown by CMR, and you can look at different sites, not just the septum, which undergoes the infarction. If you look at the lateral wall, it's also getting thinner at one month and at six months. Uh, diastolic function improves. These are some of the changes that you see. You see the annular early diastolic velocity increasing, mitral inflow going from impaired relaxation to what looks like a normal pattern an isovolumic relaxation time that is long getting shorter in the setting of a lower left atrial pressure indicates a better LV relaxation. Histopathologically, these were biopsies obtained not just from the right ventricle, but the left ventricle. They were obtained by Guillermo Tori, who was very bold at that time and is still. Uh, and you can appreciate the, the decrease in the interstitial, the total collagen, collagen one, and particularly collagen three here. Uh, also myocyte cross-sectional area and total collagen both went down. LV stiffness improved in parallel to the drop in collagen uh, decrease using indices of LV stiffness. These are combined indices obtained by volumes by echo and pressures by cath. 
atrial size gets smaller and the amount of atrial contribution to LV filling because of active atrial contraction gets less because the ventricle doesn't need a high atrial pressure to get it filled because its diastolic properties have improved. So that was also shown. This is invasive data. If you look at the end diastolic pressure, 20 millimeters mercury here is maybe 13, 14 millimeters mercury after a successful alcohol septal ablation. This is a study, for, a large study from Dr. Sigovis and his group. Um, this is a case done, one to say relatively recently with alcohol septal ablation, a patient with advanced heart failure, almost class four. There is the septal perforator before and after alcohol injection, the septal perforator is gone. If you look at the gradient, there is a large gradient, about 115. You see early obstruction, so there is no dynamic gradient here, early peaking of the velocity, so to speak. So effective release of the gradient. The mitral inflow here is a very high E velocity going with a high LA pressure, gets lower mitral E velocity. And if you look at the pulmonary artery pressures here, the RV pressure is at least 49 millimeters mercury, it dropped to 21 millimeters mercury. The ventricle undergoes remodeling changes with increasing end diastolic and systolic dimensions. You still see this curling anterior motion of the mitral leaflet, but there is no contact with the septum. And if you look at function, this is function by CMR with tagging uh, to look at strain. Strain improves in remote sites, even in adjacent sites as well after you relieve dynamic obstruction. So as you would expect with the relation of afterload and contractility, the higher the afterload, the worse the contractility, you can say that the removal of this high afterload with obstruction leads to better systolic properties. Uh, this is a large series from uh, here in South Carolina with Dr. Valerian Fernandez published almost 12 years ago now looking at NYHA class and the uh, angina class improving. Exercise duration also improving and the improvement is persistent from five minutes to more than eight minutes. Uh, if you look at gradients, non-existent, both resting and provoked, and ejection fraction, there is a trend to decrease. This is a significant drop in ejection fraction, meaning statistically significant, but not clinically significant, really. Um, septal thickness drops from 2.1 to 1 centimeters. The thinnest septum you typically see by the second year or so, though ongoing reduction in septal thickness takes place. Outcome very similar in myectomy and ablation. This is from the same institution, the Mayo Clinic. There are also data comparing different institutions showing similar outcome. One of the bad predictors of uh, worse outcome is the residual gradient. Again, this is work with Dr. Chang when uh, years ago, showing that a patient who leaves the cath lab with a large gradient and who achieves a small myocardial infarction do not tend to do well. Again, similar findings by the Mayo Clinic here. The gradient is not measured by echo, but measured by cath. The outcome is best when the patients leave the cath lab with a gradient less than 10 millimeters mercury. Uh, what do you do if somebody goes through an ablation and doesn't do well? Can you offer them something else? Yes, you can offer them something else, which is myectomy. Of course, that comes at a higher risk. The higher risk in this small series of 20 patients was the need for permanent pacemaker. But their NYHA class improves, their engine improves, their exercise improves, gradients gone. As you would expect, the septum gets thinner more and more. And in general, if you have a very thick septum, you want to be more careful recommending alcohol ablation. As you see here, it dropped, but it didn't drop a lot. Myectomy will get you more complete relief here. There are several factors that can predict sudden cardiac death. The European uh, Society of Cardiology has a score. In the US, we do not, we have not adopted that score and you will see new guidelines in the near future uh, that talks about sudden cardiac death, but I'll go quickly through these. Obviously the highest risk of someone who had one of these events, recurrent unexplained syncope, 
a positive family history in first degree relatives, maximum thickness, abnormal blood pressure response to exercise thought to reflect autonomic dysfunction and unsustained ventricular tachycardia on alter. Other variables are shown here. These do not necessarily pray, have equal weight when you think about sudden cardiac death and recommendations. This is a study from Spirito and Marin published 20 years ago, showing the effect of maximum wall thickness and the incidence of sudden cardiac death. Yes, the higher the wall thickness, the greater the incidence, but you can also appreciate that individuals with lower th septal thickness, with lower maximum wall thickness than 30 millimeters still have a high risk of sudden death. So it does not solve, uh, it's not old. Uh, another indicator, we touched on the late gadolinium hyperenhancement, perhaps the pathway for ventricular tachycardia is in these areas of hyperenhancement with replacement fibrosis. And this is a study from Chen and Martin Marin showing the relation between LGE as a percent of LV mass and the five-year event rate. And you can see the higher the mass, the higher the total mortality, sudden death, and also the end-stage hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This was an observational study. It has its own limitations. And there is now an NIH-sponsored registry in the US and in Europe looking more specifically at sudden cardiac death uh, and other CMR markers. Example of a lot of scarring and aneurysmal formation shown here in a patient with apical hypertrophy. We mentioned an apical aneurysm. So medical therapy was looked at in animal studies, and I'm not going to go over the animal studies, but will dwell on clinical studies that have been published. As you would expect, the smaller clinical studies you will go through are indeed small. So this was a 20-patient study, took patients with non-obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. They gave them losartan based on data showing that losartan can improve uh, hypertrophy meaning regress hypertrophy in an animal model. That was a mouse model. This was only 20 patients with nine and 11 in each group. There was a trend towards lower LV mass by CMR as the gold standard. The p-value was 0.06 and fibrosis increased more in the placebo group than in the group that received low sartan ended up 31% in the placebo versus 26%. By itself, this is a very large percent. The vast majority of patients that we see when you look at their average scar content, it's much less than that. I'd say in the five to 10% range at the most. Another trial looked at using deltaism. This was a 38 patients. These were carriers. And the thought was if we give the, if they receive deltaism, then the development of hypertrophy will not take place. So it included uh, individuals in the younger age group from uh, and the duration of the treatment wasn't terribly long. Obviously, if you're going to take younger individuals, you would need to follow them longer time to see whether hypertrophy develops or not. Long story short, deltaism at 360 milligrams a day or five milligram per kilo per day did not result in, regret, in preventing hypertrophy development. What turned out to be statistically significant in this study was an end diastolic dimension that increased more with growth in the HCM mutation carriers than who received the drug than those who did not receive the drug. So some sort of a signal, you can say a positive signal, but more needs uh, to sort of be done. This is a study done with A.J. Marion, looking at statins, and again, it followed an animal study. 32 patients uh, included in 18 months, they took the drug and they took it effectively to the extent that LDL was decreased by 55%. But when you look at all indices of LV morphology, hypertrophy, function, nothing different. More recently, another study with A.J. Marion looking at uh, N-acetylcysteine. The idea is that oxidative stress is implicated in the pathogenesis of hypertrophy and fibrosis. And so if you use that, drug, you may be able to suppress it. We looked at all indices of morphology by ECHO and by CMR. Uh, 
and function by echo and by CMR, including strains and so on, and nothing panned out to be different. In comparison to these studies comes Mavacampton. The idea of Mavacampton is illustrated on this slide. If you think of actin-myosin interaction across bridge forms, and that leads to production of force. It is thought that patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have a lot of active myosin heads and so a lot of force, so to speak, more contractility, more obstruction. And if you end up or if you are able to change these myosin heads from or take them away from engaging with actin, so you get into what is called super relaxed state of myosin, you will have less interaction and lower contractility. Makes sense, that's how beta blockers work, that's how disoperamide works. So it's a negative inotrope. Uh, the way it works, it's an allosteric inhibitor of myosin ATPase and was, there are animal data published by Dr. Seidman and her group showing it releases, it, it results in regression of hypertrophy and almost normalizing the phenotype. The Explorer is a study that included a decent number of patients, 120 some in two groups, 120 in each of the two groups, included 68 clinical sites, 108 patients enrolled in the US, some from Israel and a lot from Europe. The drug was handled in a double blind, the trial was conducted in a double blind fashion. So the investigators did not know if the patient received drug or placebo. I would say you were still expected to examine the patient. And so somebody received the drug you could, and they received an effective dose, uh, you get a hint. Having said that, some patients were left with big gradients um, or with significant signs of obstruction, and they would still say they feel better. So not to ignore the placebo effect. Anyway, uh, patients started at a small dose, smaller dose, five milligrams, and there were two phases where the drug could be titrated either up or down based on the levels, and also left ventricular ejection fraction and the severity of obstruction. This was done blinded to the investigators. And then towards the end, a washout period was allowed. At baseline, the two groups, the Mavacampton and the placebo groups, were comparable in everything. This was mostly an NYHA class two population. Peak oxygen consumption, very similar, though I would say higher than the usual patients we end up referring for myectomy or ablation. Pretty high anti-pro BMP levels in some cases. Um, and all of them were on beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. Patients were not allowed to have beta blockers and calcium channel blockers, and then on top of that, randomized to the trial, one or the other. Also, patients were not allowed to be on disopyramide. The reason is the concern for the negative enotropic effects now adding up. Gradients at rest, as you see them with Valsalva, pretty high and also higher with exercise EF normal. The primary endpoint was a change from baseline to week 30. Uh, peak oxygen consumption increasing by at least 1.5 milliliter per kilo per minute, along with an improvement of at least one NYHA class or an improvement in three mLs per kilo per minute of peak oxygen consumption and no worsening. These are many other secondary endpoints. If you look at the secondary endpoints and the primary endpoint, all of them uh, were much better with Mavacampton, uh, very remarkable results as you see on this slide. Uh, so this drug is uh, obviously moving forward um, and we'll share with you more news about it later on. The idea of centers of excellence is important. What is a center of excellence? It's a center that offers multidisciplinary care to the patients and their families. And that means not just hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but also EP, surgery, interventional procedures, heart failure, as some patients will end up with transplantation. When you look at the outcomes of these centers, particularly those that are related to procedures, so we can talk about myectomy, alcohol ablation, cardiac transplantation, they are linked to the volume of these centers. There is a learning curve and there is a component of training as well as QA that needs to happen through all 
the stages at which these patients are evaluated. Just to show you an example, this is the number of septal myectomies and the number of alcohol ablations by, uh, in several hospitals. You can see that the vast majority of hospitals, 120 hospitals or so, do very few procedures. One or two hospitals may do 100 ablations or 100 myectomies. This is the impact. If you divide them by tertiles, the first, the second, and the third tertile that does the most volumes, problems, be it myectomy or with ablation, are most likely in those that do the least procedures. With that, I'm going to end.